So hello, everyone. So the panel that uh, we are uh, going to be talking about today is, um, yes, the title is Digital, a Yellow Click Road to a New Business Oz um, is um, inspirational, let's say. Um, and, but the, the focus of the panel is basically on whether the digital age is benefiting uh, women in business, women entrepreneurs, and if so, how? how in accessing capital, how in gaining top executive seats, um, in growing networks, growing businesses, in emerging businesses that might never have emerged otherwise. And we hope to give you some examples that are both um, inspirational, but that are also instructive as much as, as, much as we can. Um, and we also want to be honest about the failures, about what uh, what the digital age cannot do, um, what the role of private versus public is, where regulation and policy can intervene and where it should be left up to the private sector. Um, just a quick, if I could ask, just it's always good to know, I think, for the panelists, sort of who, who is in the audience, how many of you are entrepreneurs or have started a business in the last two years, let's say? Okay, not so many. So how many of you are in the world of business? Okay, and how many of you are in the world of policy making? Okay, so that's quite balanced. Okay, that's good to just know our audience. All right, to discuss these is our star-studded audience, um, Anne Cairns, Vice Mayor Chairman of MasterCard, uh, Shandana Gulsar Khan, a Member of Parliament of Pakistan and Chair of the Commonwealth Women Parliamentarians, um, and Joanna Santanon, a Partner at EY for Entrepreneurship. So Anne, I'd like to start with you. So the business case um, for women uh, in, in business um, has long been made. Can you give us a sense of where we are now, an update, and in particular uh, in where the digital age has, had, has brought about successes, with some concrete examples, if you could? Sure. So where we are now is on the cusp of the Internet of Things, and that means 200 billion connected devices by next year. And in terms of things that have changed over the last few years, um, certainly we at MasterCard have connected up half a billion more people into the financial system since 2015. And the way that we've done this is working with governments, with NGOs, and with local technology companies and players to create ecosystems that work because of digital infrastructure. And I think that many other companies have also progressed in this space to actually include people around the world through technology. Um, I was with the CEO of Vodafone the other day and he told me that he had a target of 50 million more handsets into the hands of women. Now, what we can see in the political arena is popularism, um, almost internalization happening inside countries around the world, and yet big business needs to have global trade operating. And so there's a lot of focus on supply chains, and those supply chains can also help women. So I'll give you one more example. Uh, we have worked with Unilever, in Africa to actually digitize the supply chain from Unilever, supplying products to a small shopkeeper, could be something like soap powder, and the shopkeeper selling those products to the person who comes into the shop to buy them. Why have we done that? Because in the past, the shopkeepers could not get funding from the banks to buy products from Unilever in advance. And so they waited until the shelves became empty in order to reorder. We digitized the supply chain and we took the data to the banks and said, lend money to these shopkeepers. And many of those shopkeepers were women entrepreneurs in Africa. And on the back of that, the banks did lend and the business increased 20% across 16,000 shopkeepers in the space of a few months. That's what business can do in the digital age. But having said that, MasterCard's just done an index across 58 countries of women entrepreneurs. And what we see around the world is that whether you're in Britain, 
whether you're in Japan, whether you're in Latin America, or you're in Africa, or India, or Pakistan, some of the problems are universal. Women are not getting access to capital. They're not getting access to working capital every day credit to run their businesses, and that's a problem, which I think Joanne might talk to us about. Yeah, you deal, you deal with smaller realities. Obviously, when you're talking about MasterCard and Unilever, it's one thing. You deal with smaller companies, smaller entrepreneurs, particularly in the UK. What has your experience been? So I think, I mean, that's right. When you look at entrepreneurs, um, I think, I, and interestingly, the procurement issue is a massive issue for all um, entrepreneurs, but for female entrepreneurs in particular. So when you talk to female entrepreneurs, they'll very often say, all of these great schemes are brilliant, you know, mentoring, helpful, um, but what we really want is people to buy our stuff. So I think we have to look very carefully at the procurement process. How does big business, in the, like, similar to the example that Anne talked about in Africa, look and support smaller business, particularly where it's female-led? Because the challenge becomes that the, typically the businesses that are led by females are smaller in scale, and they find it harder to navigate the challenges that big business puts into their supply chain and their procurement process. So I think that is very much an issue that smaller business faces, particularly where it's female-led. Um, and then the second challenge, as, as, as Anne identifies, is at that access to capital. So however you look at it, female-led businesses have very little of venture capital money. So there are a variety of surveys, and you can look at it, um, but typically, any survey will tell you it's between 1% and 5% of VC money ends up in the hands of female-led businesses. It gets slightly better if we look at businesses that have a female as a founder. So that then goes up to about 18% of VC money goes to uh, businesses that have a female as a founder. But that's typically because businesses today are more likely to have co-founders than they were a decade ago. And those co-founders will very often be a marketing kind of person who might be more likely to be a female. Um, so that then comes back to where is the real wealth in the hands of? So when you look at those businesses, the stats are being distorted. So it looks like they're getting better, 18%, way better than in 12% that it was a decade ago. But actually, what proportion of that equity really lands in the hand of a female founder, and how much of that equity sits in the hands of the, of the man um, who has the original idea. Let me push you on that just a little bit mm. more. What's the reason for that? Is it that most of VCs are in the hands of men? Is it that the pitching process sometimes is something that traditionally men have done, maybe women would do it in a different way, but it's different than the ecosystem that already ex exists? What is it? Because once we know the reason, we can start to tackle it. And you, Anne, were saying, and I'll move to you in one second, Shannon, but you were saying that actually in fintech, you had experience where 40% of the startups you're, you've worked with were, were, have women founders, or maybe it's one of the founders. Yeah. Well, actually, I think your comment about the pitching process is real. There's been mm -hmm. a lot of analysis yeah. done on that around the world. And funnily enough, I met a head of a VC um, who said to me, I've actually eliminated the pitching process from my buying criteria, my investment criteria. And once I did that and just worked on the business case in front of me, and this is like having a blind interview, mm -hmm. if you like, then I discovered the business cases put forward by the women were really strong, and I started investing in many more women-led businesses. So I think that is one of the aspects of it. It, it definitely is, but I, I also think part of the challenge you have is that only 60% of VCs um, in a recent survey said they were interested in diversifying their founders' portfolio. Um, and of that 60%, the majority of them will then say they haven't done anything in particular to change the way that they source investments. So what they rely on, and, and VCs generally rely on their networks, the people that they know, to source the opportunities that they invest in. So if they're only relying on their old networks, their old networks come up with all the same opportunities that they had before. So they're just not seeing the volume of diversified opportunities to really invest in diversified business as they get there. And, and I think the other challenge that, that we see a lot of is 
you know, people, entrepreneurs, become entrepreneurs because they are passionate about an idea. That means that, generally, the, there's a huge raft of female entrepreneurs who will be interested in something that will help the lives of women. It's, it's, it's the thing that they know best. It's a virtual cycle. So it's a virtual cycle, which means when they go and pitch to a bunch of guys, the guys don't get the idea. Yeah, so there's a great example in the UK of um, a pelvic floor app and um, device. Oh, that's great. Great. <laughs> um, but the female founder will tell you that she went to pitch to a VC house who put in front of her three middle-aged guys who clearly know nothing about the challenges that women have with pelvic floors. And their answer when she said, I think we're going to have a problem because you're not going to understand this, was to bring their 19-year-old secretary <laughs> into the room to help them identify whether this was a great product or not. You know, funnily enough, they didn't do a deal together. Um, but I think that epitomizes the challenge that female entrepreneurs face, where you work in a world where the majority of VC investors are men, and you're pitching a product or a service that is aimed at women, it is a lot less likely that you're going to get funding. So this is a perfect segue. Shandana, you know, you're the, you can speak to the problem of women entrepreneurs in Pakistan. Not only you have two roles, obviously, member of parliament in Pakistan and, and, um, and also chair of, of the Commonwealth Women Parliamentarian, but let's talk about Pakistan for a moment. Mm -hmm. The challenges are even cultural and greater, perhaps, for, for women entrepreneurs. Can you talk a little bit about that? The challenges, but also some success stories that you've seen in your country. All right, thank you. So uh, it's interesting that um, when we talk about the digital revolution or the digit digital uh, the status quo, wherever we are in this in the middle of the revolution where we're past it, it's interesting. And if I could start just with the Commonwealth, a little thing. In the Commonwealth, we have uh, the four giants, which is United uh, United Kingdom. We have. And New Zealand, we have Australia, we have Canada, who've done far more, both in terms of business and government, for female entrepreneurs. That's not to say it came naturally easy, but that's where they were in their level of development. In the rest of the Commonwealth, and we have Singapore and Malaysia, perhaps, who've done better, and there's India as well. But by and large, in the Commonwealth, the problems across are similar to what we face in Pakistan. Now, hearing this discussion is extremely encouraging, but it's also very focused on a specific aspect of entrepreneurship, which was in some sense procurement, or how do we do the sales pitch. Right now, we found we have two success stories in Pakistan. One is called Karandas, one is Epiphany. One young woman called Samar Hassan has been spearheading those. And what she did is the following. She realizes many women that want to be entrepreneurs, but don't know the first thing. The other problem, as the cultural problem you put it, is what if I don't want to leave my house? What if I don't want to go to an office? What if I don't want to work with men? What if I want the security of my home, my children? I don't have help, so I can't leave my kids at home. There is no childcare. So what we've done successfully, rather successfully, for a small amount of women in two of our provinces is that we brought work to them, to their houses. We brought them the skills. We brought them the digital training. We brought them the entrepreneurial training. We brought them the regular skills training. Where we're still lagging is, of course, the export bit. We have the product. We just don't know how to sell it abroad, as you already mentioned. But there's another pro uh, problem, and that is a policy problem that we face in many countries across the Commonwealth, is how to convince the central banks of our country to trust platforms like eBay, platforms like Amazon, um, other platforms like PayPal, because those are concrete issues. So being in the policy chair, we have two kinds of problems. A, how to get the women out there, and by out there I mean where they want to be. It's not my business to tell a woman how she wishes to live her life. If she likes segregation, if she likes not working outside the home, then we have to respect that. And the second aspect, if I may, is we've recently introduced a policy on e-commerce, and we're hoping to use the old channels. We don't have the resources to start all over again. We can copy paste what others have done successfully. But one thing which we have in Pakistan is the post office. The old post offices that you have globally, the little red boxes. All over Pakistan, we're trying to make use of those now. So connect five or six different ministries. So as I said, the Commonwealth is massive. Pakistan is one of the countries where we're trying to now we have to leapfrog. We don't have the uh, luxury of time trying to do what others have done. We have to jump many, many boundaries. 
So in some sense, uh, we're very successful, but there are risks, there are problems to which we'll come to, mm -hmm. I think, later on. But so, in, I, again, if I could press you, you say, so you're saying we, we did this, we did this. You're yes. speaking from a policy perspective. Yes. And so when you said we helped these entrepreneurs, these were for, from a series of laws, a series of policy changes, or did you work with big business? a la model that Anne was talking about before. So interestingly, uh, we're one of the most, uh, Pakistan is one of the most overly legislated countries anywhere in the world. But we found that legislation, surprisingly, wasn't helping. We needed a few tweaks in the rules. We needed a couple of new legislations, including a cyber crime law, because the more women that were online, uh, it's a safe place to get harassed as well, safe place for the people harassing them. So those were the kind of laws that we brought in against cybercrime, against uh, harassment of women. Um, it's interesting that across the Commonwealth, there's different perceptions of what safety online is. If I don't want a picture of me, despite the fact that I'm a public figure, if I don't want a picture of me online, I can make that work for me. So it's not that it's all uh, out there, it's all uh, fair play, no. A woman has her rights to her privacy, uh, perhaps even far more than men in some funny sense. But the cyber crime law was also prohibitive in terms of how much the government uh, can find out about you. So there has, we've tried very hard, we're still struggling to have a balance between privacy and freedom because one can't work without the other. So for us, transforming the business place for women has been less about legalities and more about logistics, connecting exporters to trade development authority, to commerce ministry, to women's ministry, to labor ministry, that has been the difficult part. Making sure that the 50,000 policies we have actually come together to produce an exportable good. There's one product I'm selling and 43 different regulatory authorities. That chokehold has been strangling entrepreneurial uh, abilities of women more than anything else. So that's right, Anne, please, because yeah, I was yeah. going to ask you about this. <laughs> yes. yeah. um, so, um, uh, you know, I think, first of all, Shandana, I thought that your comments about the education side were really important because if you actually give people access without education, I think it's pretty dangerous. Yes. Whereas if you give them education and they don't have access, that's just like totally pointless. So I think these things have to come together. Um, and the point you brought about the technology allows women to work in situ is so important. I mean, it's not just that. In the business world, technology enables us to be flexible and to work wherever we are and to actually balance our lives with this work, with our families and so on. Yes. And, and provides a certain amount of anonymity. I mean, we were talking in the green room about if you, you know, say, wore a veil, you know, you're, you're behind a screen. Yes. Um, it's an interesting thing to think that about. Is, yeah. uh, but I think the other th concept that, that you brought up was the one of trust. Yes. And we see this everywhere in the world. The trust is something that really has to be thought about and developed very much to be able to get this whole internet of things to work properly. Um, and perhaps um, the Europeans are out in advance in terms of thinking of the privacy laws and GDPR, although we believe that they will pervade across the world in one form or another. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I do think that the big um, digital players and players like MasterCard who understand how a financial infrastructure works, how to protect against cyber crime and so on, become more relevant in this age of actually creating trust. It becomes something that enables commerce and enables women to actually join you know, the whole world of e-commerce in a, in a safe way. Um, but to educate them exactly how to do that is very important. So, Anne, you raised a, a, an, an important point, obviously, you both have raised on trust. So my question would, for you would be, is that trust something that has to emerge in the, that, that just has to emerge from society? or is it something you have to legislate? In other words, Shandana made the case very strongly for regulation and policy coming in because there was a logistical problem. A needed to connect to P, which needed L and Z. Where is the role of regulation and where is the role of, of private companies in this? Well, absolutely, the regulators have to pay, play their part. And I, you know, I do, as I said, GDPR, I mean, that's a, that's a regulation. It's, it's, 
you know, created by the European Commission, and I think it, w it will pervade around the world. And if you think about the financial world, it's a very heavily regulated environment. So certainly regulators play their part, certainly governments play their part in terms of how they want their you know, citizens to have access and how things should work in their countries. Um, but I also think big business plays its part about ha setting standards about how things work around the world. And, um, and making global trade work and so on. And I think that is really important in this internet age um, because that then creates the connectivity. And certainly a place that we play in, we actually set global standards by which everyone operates. And, um, and I do think that creates a, a level playing field, a fairness, uh, and perhaps a fairness that hasn't actually existed in the world of women for quite a while. But I think the key to this is access. And one of those big keys is actually digital identity. Because if you are born as a woman in Africa, you might not be registered at birth. You may not have a passport. You might not have a driver's license. I mean, who are you? How can you actually be recognized? And that's why you see all of this push of governments into biometric and digital identities and so on to actually be able to recognize their citizens. And uh, governments play a big role in that, as do NGOs, as do technology companies, um, as does the financial system. You have to have an ecosystem to make that work. And with the internet of things, you can't have that. You can't have the internet of everything without the inclusion of everyone. And how do you get the inclusion of everyone? Digital identity. Yeah, you know, the, the thing you've talked about most is the sort of that regulation governments have to create the level playing field above all. Uh -huh. But Joanna, I would imagine that a lot of the companies that you work with, again, smaller realities that can be choked by red tape, that can be, you know, that can, well, or even the VCs that we talked about before, you know, there's a limit to what regulation can do. I mean, a, a free space to operate may actually be better for the entrepreneurs you deal with. Yeah, I think for a lot of entrepreneurs, a, a free space is absolutely what they desire and require. Um, if, you, if you choke them too soon, they just won't get off the ground, uh, for sure. But, but equally, um, you know, I think that you have to have, you do have to have that level playing field. You do have to, so you know, coming back to, if you don't have a digital identity, how are you actually gonna get off the ground and get business? Because without the digital identity, you don't get a big bank account. So for an entrepreneur, that's catastrophic. Um, and I think, you know, you see in the UK with the rise of all of the, um, the, the new banks, um, a real shift and actually, in fact, one of the um, chaps that came through Entrepreneur of the Year this year, his sole driver, coming back to you, you do what you know and you do what you're passionate about, his sole driver was that he had come from Estonia to the UK as, a, as an educated man with a degree who'd had previous careers and jobs, couldn't get a bank account, therefore couldn't get a job, therefore couldn't get somewhere to live. Um, so actually, his entrepreneurial passion was about providing inclusion for immigrants to be able to have a bank account and, and therefore be able to get a job and get, a, get a accommodation. Um, so I think it is true, but I think actually that inclusion is vital, absolutely vital for all entrepreneurs. But, it, but it's interesting because I've seen it drive the passion of one to kind of make sure that they can then all go forward. You can't start unless you have your own identity and you can have a bank account. So we have six minutes left. It's gone very fast, but I would like our last round to ask you um, to sort of be honest about you know, what has not worked and that if you had sort of a magic wand or if you could say next year we have this same panel at this same conference, what would you want either in terms of commitments by big, big, big companies facilitation for smaller companies, regulation, governments. Um, you know, you mentioned GDPR, obviously, that, you know, the European Commission has been, uh, this is, has, has been one of their biggest achievements of, of the last decade. Um, what would it be? What would be the, the, the one thing that you hope that, that women entrepreneurs and, and women in business would achieve, be able to achieve by next year? 
Next year, this time in Reykjavik. Next year, this time in okay. Reykjavik. We make an appointment to come back. And you can all jump in. There's no order of this. If, yeah. somebody, if one of you wants to think and about it. And you can hold it. us to it because you're recording this. <laughs> okay. We all moved to Iceland. Maybe that's the solution. So uh, in some sense, there are, there's two answers. The easy answer for the Commonwealth is because we're tied by 180 different legislatures. So you can imagine there's 180 different policy-making bodies. If we can get our act together, it's not that difficult to come out with one small, not legislation, but policy, which we then float around around all our parliaments for female entrepreneurs. For that, of course, we need the input of the private sector and those more developed countries who have actually done it successfully. So that's an easier answer. When it comes but, sorry, to my what would that policy be? What would that one policy be? Financial inclusion, uh, DFS, Digital Financial Inclusion for Women. Now, for Pakistan, it might be a little bit harder because we have certain constitutional issues in which we've divided sort of the problems between the province and the centers. And we've got banking in the center, women's issues at the, uh, at the um, provinces. We've got industry in the center, commerce in the center, but then labor and uh, food and agriculture, all these things that involve women entrepreneurs in the provinces. So for us, I guess we'll have to have one common Again, policy, not legislation, that takes years to produce. One common policy which will recognize that this is a special group of people. They don't do business as usual. So there has to be some sort of relaxation of policies, and that can happen in one year. That's not a problem. Income tax will be a problem. Banking will be a problem. So, so we don't even go there. What we get at is the smaller, little, inclusive, um, uh, we've got a brilliant little program going with the World Economic Forum on skill development. So if we can have just that all across the country, because the skills we have right now don't match anything that is happening in the world. So that little policy step, if we can take that, and I intend to go back and do that, uh, start that off, but again, in uh, partnership with the private sector, because government alone can't do much. We need a buy-in from the private sector. Joanna? Uh, for me, it would be um, policy around procurement. Uh, so I think, you know, I've seen uh, we have, that there's a degree of policy around procurement, but what happens is that I think government policy then gets itself all tied up with being fair, being equal, uh, everybody pitching on the same terms, and that can make it very difficult for small up and coming female led businesses to compete. They don't have the same level of balance sheet. So I think some degree of procurement policy that acknowledges that female entrepreneurs will have a different, a different start point, but allows them to start to play. Because if you never let them start to play, they'll never grow to be big enough to compete. But let me push you on that just a little bit. For What would it take to get to that? When you say procurement policy, is that something that can be legislated? Is that something that every company has to commit to, you know, I think if think government did it as a, if, if government could do it for government spend, so you look at how much money government spend, so if government led the way, then business could be encouraged to follow. So, so I don't think you can legislate for, for companies uh, in terms of what they do. You know, so e EY have their own policy. I know different businesses have their own policy about the spend that they will commit to female-led businesses. But if government really led the way, it would encourage more businesses to do it. So I think government policy for government spend that really genuinely allowed female entrepreneurs to play in that government field. Because you know, there's a, there's a great, there was a great example a few years back where you know, the, the female-led entrepreneur uh, managed to win the tender against big business, but then spent, 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 spent to invest to develop the thing that the government had required but government aren't paying her because their, their payment plan is so much so long that it doesn't allow a small entrepreneur to play. So I think you have to kind of look at not just um, what happens at the outset in the pitch, but how does that play out for a smaller entrepreneur? And it's, to be fair, it isn't that government policy mitigates against female entrepreneurs. It just mitigates against small, small. business. M male or female. Male or yeah. female. The problem is, is that more, more of the female businesses are small. 
So they're particularly disadvantaged when you come to the government spend. So I think that for me, it would be really, really looking across the world, where do governments spend their money and how could they divert more of it into the hands of small entrepreneurs, which should lead, lend itself to female. Anne. So I'm not going to talk about the government angle because I think you two have covered it <laughs> so incredibly well. And uh, what I'd say is, we're on the cusp of the Internet of Things. 200 billion internet-connected devices. Businesses around the world have a massive role to play. Most economies are driven by SMEs, and many of these economies are driven by women SMEs through necessity in some of the developing markets, and the developed markets, but also through opportunity in some of the big developed markets. The question is, what can business do to make sure these women are connected, can transact, can sell their goods all over the planet, and how can we work together in consortiums, JVs, in partnerships with governments, to make this happen everywhere in the world. It will start with digital identity, it will move through into e-commerce, it will be the telcos, it will be the finance companies, it will be the big global money-moving networks like MasterCard that can make this happen for women. And I think that we can actually make it happen really fast for millions and millions of women between this year and next year. And I'll look forward right. to coming back Good. to tell you so what in that closing, number is. So in closing the panel, we ask that we all be invited <laughs> next year so we can see where, where, what we've achieved uh, between now and then. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the audience as well. Thank you.